A warm welcome, everybody, to our webinar. This is our 11th edition of the Allianz Risk Barometer. My name is Tusang Mahlangu. I'm the CEO of Allianz in South Africa. This afternoon, I'm accompanied by a great lineup of speakers. And uh, we have our chief economist from Allianz SE, Ludovic Subran, Dr. Selin Ozet, who's our senior economist for France and Africa from Eula Hermes, Senzile Ndlozi, our business development manager from AGCS South Africa, and Arthur Yao, who is our regional chief underwriting and reinsurance officer of Allianz Africa. Before Ludovic takes over the stage, let me quickly share a few facts about the Allianz Risk Parameter. This is an annual survey that we have conducted in Allianz since 2010. And what is the purpose of the survey? Essentially, we want to know what keeps corporate business leaders up at night. We want to know from these experts, what are the most important business risks to look out for in the next 12 months? And who are these experts that we uh, talk to? Um, these are our CEOs, risk managers, brokers, and insurance experts. And as you can see, we've managed to uh, get responses from 2,650 experts across 89 countries, 22 industry sectors. And also what's special about this year is that we have several African countries and Middle Eastern countries that are featured in the Allianz Risk Barometer. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's have some drum rolls and we wanna welcome on your screens, our chief economist of Allianz, Ludovic Subran. Over to you, Ludovic. Thank you very much, Tusang. It's a pleasure to be here, and I can confirm one thing: you you have such a radio voice. You know, you should consider uh, having a side gig. You know, on top of ensuring the largest corporates in Africa. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I have um, five slides or six slides, but I know you all want to know about the uh, Russian conflict, so I will talk a bit about that. It was not planned in my slides, but I, I may uh, allude to some of the effects this will have, as you may have seen the sanctions are unfolding as we speak and um, I'm sure the Q&A will also be partly dedicated to this. So 2022 is a very interesting year because it's the year of normalization, but it's very uneven. Uh, we've talked in that forum last year about the exorbitant privilege of the vaccine the North has. Uh, we've talked also about the exorbitant privilege of the uh, fiscal and monetary policy galore that the North has and this is very important to understand that 2022 will be more difficult for the emerging markets uh, for the southern hemisphere. And this is something which is uh, not OK, uh, but this is something that needs uh, further caution. What I mean by this is starting with China. China will be contributing to global GDP in the least way since 2015. If I look at emerging markets, some of them have proactively tried to manage uh, the deceleration of growth and the tighter, tighter monetary condition, but still some, uh, some issues remain, especially for countries that are very um, dependent on tourism. Uh, on the contrary, countries that have uh, commodity exports have been doing very fine. So you can see 2022 and 2023 is a big split between, uh, I would say, some countries that still have a bit of uh, tailwind and some other countries that are still uh, trying to reconnect with their growth engines. And Celine will talk more about Africa and South Africa. And clearly here, tourism and commodities are the two legs of, of, of South Africa. But in the other uh, economies of, of Africa, you also have this role of services, industry and commodities playing very different uh, parts in the recovery of, of the continent. If I go to the next slide, uh, trade has been uh, rebounding uh, quite nicely. We have here again the normalization of trade. This starts with the normalization of the supply chain disruptions, which has been uh, a major impediment to growth uh, for a lot of corporates, including on the continent. Uh, we expect those to come by the end of the year. We already see a uh, better outlook on, on trade costs and prices. Um, we also see better outlook on uh, some specific shortages, even though other shortages such as chips are still very high. Omicron seems to be well managed, which was a big uh, concern for the uh, future of supply chain shortages. But remember that behind what you see conjuncturally, there are also some structural changes, in particular, the fact that consumption moved from services to goods 
made a lot of those containers that you see uh, on ships full of um, uh, electronic products. And so there is less room for industrial uh, inputs. And this is, I think, one of the biggest effects of what I call the Amazon effect on trade, this relative arbitrage between things that the consumer wants because he can go less to the restaurant. So he, you know, home nests more. Uh, he tries to equip himself more with some household equipment. And as a consequence, there is a bit less space, less room, as global trade has been stress tested for industrial inputs. We believe this situation is going to normalize by 2023. But in the meantime, the costs will remain quite high. You may have seen some numbers in the past week, especially on uh, Germany, for example, reported uh, producer price is going up at as much as 24% in the first uh, months of 2022. Uh, half of it is energy related, but the other half is indeed still very much uh, supply shortage related. If you go to the next slide, you have the demonstration, I would say, on the supply issue that I just mentioned. Um, it is a supply uh, driven inflation issue in most of the world, maybe except from the US, uh, where they have on top a bit more of a wage price barrel um, in the UK also where they have on top some uh, lack of, of labor supply immigration. Uh, but it is, as I said, not everywhere the same issue. Um, and so 2022 will continue to be a bit problematic and, and uh, supply chain managers are going to still be, uh, you know, trying to make meat and everywhere around the world logisticians are the new chief digital officers uh, of, of the world. They, they are actually more important today than CEOs in most companies. If I go to the next slide, you have the impact of uh, this, I would say more vibrant inflation on the rather hawkish move of central banks. So from the Federal Reserve of the United States to the Bank of England to the European Central Bank, we see that uh, central banks are ready to hike interest rates and to decrease the asset purchases and this of course has consequences on the emerging world starting by tighter monetary and financial conditions but also depending on the country it um, means that uh, some some countries may decide to hike proactively to avoid a depreciation of the currency and to avoid uh, what uh, they went through in 2013 with the so-called state taper tantrum what does it mean it means that we expect uh, African central banks to also try to avoid any currency pressure because of the additional cost it will have huh? on top of the food inflation. If you have a stark depreciation of currencies, this would be, of course, uh, very costly for the poorest households in the countries and clearly create a bit more um, um, reason for social unrest. So this is something we are monitoring uh, vividly. Right now, it seems that, you know, policy mistakes are still possible, but uh, contained, I would say, both in, in the um, the US, the Eurozone, but also on the continent. One exception may be Nigeria. Um, some people are also concerned about Ghana. I'm sure uh, Celine will talk about that. Um, I will go directly to the corporates and then talk, as I said, uh, briefly about Russia. So uh, Celine, if you can skip two slides. Yeah, and the next one. What does it mean for corporates, right? Most of you are um, business leaders. So uh, the good news is that corporates are faring quite okay uh, in spite of the crisis. Uh, the pandemic is mostly behind us. And as a result, some corporates chose to get more debt, but cash, uh, cash holdings of corporates are actually rather uh, good everywhere. So credit risk is contained, of course they are some zombie companies, there are some companies that uh, will, whose business model will be changed forever and will have uh, to, to, to disappear as the economy really reopens. Um, that's the case in the hospitality sector, in the retail sector, in the transport sector, in the construction sector. But overall, I would say I'm quite uh, fascinated also because, you know, I come from Yule Hermes where we are, you know, always taking the pulse of insolvencies to see that credit risk is so far contained. And of course, I say so far because there are risks uh, here and there, but um, there is still 
some cash on the balance sheet of companies and therefore the need to invest. And I would say this is a big call to action for a lot of corporates. Um, you know, there is so much cash on some of the balance sheets that the risk of not doing much with it is much higher, I would say, than uh, the, the, the odds of uh, taking a risk on it and, and, and having a full investment cycle. Pricing power is very different. So how you transmit inflation to uh, your customers, uh, how can you offset the wage bill increases. So it's very different sector to sector, but I think in the industrial sector, especially for the African continent, there is uh, the opportunity of, of having a form of an investment cycle going forward. So as, as mentioned, I will talk a bit about the Russia-Ukraine crisis. So it is unfolding. Uh, the, the difference with 2014, for some of you that remember the Crimea situation is that Russia is much stronger than it was in 2014, uh, it navigated uh, the uh, the pandemic horribly in terms of casualties, but it has been actually benefiting from the rebound in oil prices. And so today, uh, the choice is is indeed to see how we react um, as as Europe, as as the West, I would say, on this infringement on the uh, on on the people of the Donbas uh, region. It's a very tough uh, situation. You've seen financial markets correct. Um, I, I believe that this will be short-lived in a way because there is still a lot of policy room to maneuver, uh, maybe less uh, uh, financial tightening from from uh, from Europe, um, and maybe a bit more energy uh, checks and handouts to offset the price of the increase of energy. And just to give you an idea, uh, the, the Chancellor of Germany just announced that uh, he will not certify the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So that doesn't have really an effect today on the price of energy of Germany, but of course it has an effect, or at least the effect of today's price um, on on Europe. The price of energy and gas are very strong. So the question is whether um, governments may decide to offset uh, some of this energy costs for the poorest. Um, and and the reason why I mentioned this, uh, the energy and the trade issue, the relative strengths of of, of Russia compared to 2014. And also the financial stress is because one of the question that is going to be unfolding in the next few days is the choice of today going very gradual with the sanctions. You may have seen Europe announce some sanctions, uh, the UK announce some sanctions, the US are expected to announce some sanctions. Is one to avoid, I would say, unplugging the financial system, the so-called sanctions on the SWIFT and the payment mechanisms between banks, because nobody really knows what would happen. Right? It's, a, it's a global Jenga of uh, of of uh, of uh, relative dependencies um but this is an important choice to go gradual because uh, as i just said you know russia is in a situation of relative good economic strength and so that means that we could be in a limbo situation for longer so so there is still uh, the idea of keeping some some powder dry uh, with not going full bazooka on the sanctions with SWIFT. But uh, that, that can mean that the situation will be um, longer, a bit more complicated, and that we will see a bit more of the economic and the financial costs as we, uh, as we unfold. And maybe in the Q&A, we can talk about whether it means something in particular for, uh, for Africa in the coming months or, or, or years. With that, I, I close um, for now and, and I, lend, uh, the, I give the floor to my colleague Céline to talk about the African outlook. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ludovic. And it's a pleasure for me to be here as well and to give you the outlook for Africa at the exit of the crisis, because last year we were talking again uh, about the crisis and now we will be heading forward and talking about recovery. Uh, I will also use only 10 minutes as uh, Ludovic did. Uh, COVID, as uh, we saw in the first part of the presentation, recovery paces continue to diverge in the world, but also uh, within Africa. The, one of the main uh, factors of this is a limited fiscal space of most African governments to put in place uh, stimulus programs, uh, massive stimulus programs that we see in advanced economies. Overall, uh, that, that's a concern regarding the convergence of Africa towards advanced uh, economies. So this is an important risk of reversing all the progress of the last decade 
because it's simply uh, African government cannot follow up with all the efforts of uh, stimulus and transition towards a more green and digital uh, economy. And uh, last year we were saying that uh, relatively more diversified economies uh, were resilient to crisis. So the hit was smaller in 2020 and 21. And now we see that those diversified economies could even go back to their strong growth path. So here I mentioned uh, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, uh, but also Ghana, uh, Egypt and Uganda. So those economies proved to be resilient and thanks to their uh, strong growth uh, potential, thanks to greater diversification. So you see on the right hand side in 2022, and we expect them to grow um, around 5%, although the continent overall is expected to grow at around 3.4%. And this year, there are also good news for commodity, especially oil exporters like uh, Algeria and Angola, uh, which were severely hit by the crisis, but now they will experience some strong recovery until, of course, the wind uh, turns to the opposite direction. Uh, regarding South Africa, the fallout, the economic fallout from the crisis was very big, very strong. The recovery in 2021 was uh, more or less okay, but it could have been better if we didn't have uh, some social unrest that we experienced in the third quarter. So we had uh, in 2021 a recovery of 4.36%. Uh, and then 2022, no wonder uh, South Africa goes back to 2% growth uh, because of structural impediments, because of lack of reforms in the um, state sector, because of difficulties in accessing power and electricity. So all the long lasting problems of South Africa would be holding back uh, the recovery of the, of the country. Uh, main risk for 2022, of course, there is inflation that uh, Ludovic uh, mentioned uh, that we see everywhere in the world. But it is a this is a um, risk for growth. A uh, second risk is uh, monetary tightening in advanced economies that could stabilize uh, access to finance for some African countries. But this is still a moderate risk, so I wouldn't insist too much on this. Uh, in the same way, uh, debt, debt sustainability concerns, we still don't expect uh, domino defaults uh, in Africa, but we are very, very careful uh, about the situation in Tunisia, Ghana, a bit less in Kenya uh, this year to see how uh, the debt sustainability uh, evolves uh, together with the tightening of international conditions. And finally, there is that sanitary risk. Today, only 11% of the African country, continent is fully vaccinated, but that leaves the door open, of course, to the emergence of new variants of the virus, which could also take a toll on economic development. So in the next slide, I would like to focus more on inflation dynamics. Africa had a very, a very relaxed, uh, Decade regarding price development. So prices, like everywhere in the world, also in Africa, uh, prices uh, were rather under control. This inflation was not a big concern until uh, things globally uh, changed because of that strong uh, demand, which could not be followed by supply conditions. So inflation in Africa is driven also by food and energy prices and at the country levels. And now, like in Nigeria, Angola, Ghana, we have a double digit inflation uh, near 20% in the case of Nigeria and Ghana. So, this is very bad news, of course, in terms of cost of living and livelihood. Also, in countries like Egypt, Kenya, South Africa, inflation is around 6%, but these are uh, historically high levels. And inflation doesn't only come from uh, the global factors. Africa is already suffering from adverse climate events. So the climate change is not a story about the future for Africa. It's what happened in the past few years and what's happening now. So some regions of Africa are facing uh, food insecurity 
put uh, food insecurity danger, which adds up already uh, existing inflationary pressure. So among these regions, UN recently warned in the Sahel region, uh, which is going towards a serious food crisis, but also we have all the Eastern region, I mean, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, but also some regions of Kenya, they are experiencing uh, extreme weather events, uh, not enough uh, rainfalls that are adding up to existing food price pressures. And all that, the combination of all that, if you take together with COVID, that hit mostly uh, informal economy, women, the most vulnerable, in a context where governments could not shield incomes. So when you put all that together, uh, these factors set the state for social unrest, uh, political instability, at the expense of democratic regimes. That this is what also we are experiencing. Uh, witnessing with several coups that happen one after the another. Uh, regarding central banks, so like everywhere in the world, if you are a central banker in Africa, uh, you, you are facing a trade-off between reacting to inflation by raising interest rates to keep inflation at bay, under control, uh, or you let it as it is so that uh, economic recovery uh, could continue its momentum, especially given that governments don't have fiscal space for budget stimulus. So it's a quite difficult situation, especially also the current inflationary pressures are coming from supply shocks, uh, energy prices. So as a central banker, by raising interest rates, you cannot much do too much there. But as explained uh, Ludovic very well, uh, it, it still helps to raise interest rates to keep exchange rates uh, stable so that uh, they can avoid a situation of imported inflation uh, spreading over uh, prices. So then in that context, what happened? Uh, Angola was the first one uh, and then followed by Ghana, South Africa, uh, cent those central banks raised their policy rates and I, they will continue to do so this year, to our opinion. But also the other ones would join, very likely to join. Here I can mention Kenya, Nigeria and even Egypt. We expect them to, to increase interest rates in 2022. Um, I pass to the next slide to give you some good news in that difficult international context. Uh, current external imbalances of African countries are reducing in 2021 and 2022. If you could move to the next slide, uh, please. Uh, and you remember in 2015, we've been through a commodity price shock, which uh, created very deep uh, current account imbalances for many African countries in a context where also they started to emit uh, huge amounts of euro bonds and turning from uh, traditional creditors to markets. So there was appetite also for uh, these euro bonds in the context of low interest rates. But now with COVID, uh, we had another commodity price uh, shock that it was short lived. And now in 2021, 2022, most current accounts are recovering. Even if you take a country like South Africa, they are recording in 2022, they expected to record the first um, surplus, current account surplus after a few decades. So overall, the improvement in current account imbalances uh, can be explained by, of course, favorable commodity demand and prices. But also we observed that imports did not recover as before uh, because of supply chain problems or because of uh, the recovery, which takes some time to, uh, to accelerate. And also uh, manufacturing exports are rather dynamic. So all these are quite good news for current accounts in a context where most African countries need to roll up their existing uh, debt, euro bonds, or they have very heavy uh, debt amortization payments this year and next year. So this is still a topic we keep on an eye on, on the external situation. Uh, I just say a few words on currencies. African currencies are expected to remain uh, stable, overall stable in 2022. Uh, if, of course, you have some exceptions of countries going towards debt crisis like Angola, Zambia, 
they had uh, very strong movements in the, their currencies. Uh, things normalized uh, more or less since the second half of 2021. And we believe that the um, uh, tightening of uh, interest rates, the tapering is already priced in in most currencies. We had some slight depreciations in Kenya and Ghana City, but still it's uh, normalizing. And regarding uh, RAND, South African RAND, from the Turkish um, currency turmoil, there was some kind of a spillover. But thanks to the central bank's action and its uh, confirmed credibility, uh, the RAND is rather stable and we expect it to remain so as we expect a continued uh, monetary policy rate hikes also this year. So on the currency side, we are not uh, worried much. And that brings me to my last slide where I want to talk about the main opportunities and key challenges regarding Africa. Uh, as we will also see from the barometer, macroeconomic and political stability is, is key to attract investment and also to let business people to, to thrive, to do business in such a high potential environment when we take the growth of large cities uh, in Africa and also the youth and the progress made with digital transformation, uh, sometimes which are like, which is going way faster than, than here in Europe. So the opportunities are, are very big. In this sense, Africa needs to attract uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, currently, only uh, the continent attracts 2% of total investment, and which only goes, uh, mostly goes to natural resources. So there is need to diversify uh, investment towards um, other sectors, education, health, building infrastructures. Currently, infrastructure projects are 95% conducted by state. Uh, so well, there's huge potential to, to, to do business there also to lift up the, the potential. Uh, the big game changer to our sense is the African continental free trade area, but we need to be patient, like the results will not happen up overnight because uh, non-tariff barriers are very important. Uh, this is about transport, this is about uh, red tape uh, institutions or uh, the customer client relations to have to need to put in place but with time and also it's not only about trade there is a huge potential uh, regarding services uh, exchange the services sector uh, through this um, free trade zone and also uh, to attract investment cross-border investment or when you do business in one country you have access you would have access to a much greater scale of customers thanks to uh, the free exchange zone and of course the user use the expected fast uh, winners would be countries which are already open which are already benefiting from uh, regional agreements and they have the, the network in place so here we see south africa morocco kenya ghana are expected to be the first uh, beneficiaries of, of this um, free trade agreement and just to tell you also a few words, this is also related to the situation with Russia. Uh, recently, we see a strong U-turn from European side uh, towards Africa. Uh, after a decade, like since the Euro area debt crisis, uh, the presence of Europe, economic presence of Europe in Africa was uh, rather weak, uh, leaving the ground to China and to Russia. Um, but now we see that Af uh, European governments uh, are getting more and more uh, aware of the importance of Africa, first of all, as a supplier of key natural resources for digital uh, for a green transition of uh, Europe. And also, as uh, it was announced by President Macron, that also last uh, Friday by the European Commission, there is a change of mind, uh, a paradigm from uh, helping for development from donor to receiver to a partnership logic, a partnership together with profitable investment in Africa. Uh, this is why the EU recently announced 150 billion investment package in Africa for green transition and sustainable agri-food systems. So this is quite important. 
And also this goes with the aim of uh, the Europe within the global gateway strategy to replace China's uh, Bath and Road initiative. This is why all these factors taken together, we strongly believe that Africa will emerge as a key regional bloc uh, in the next few years. So I will stop here and I will leave now uh, the floor to Sandrine so that she can tell us more about the main highlights of the risk barometer. Thank you so much, Celine. Really appreciate that. Uh, two words best summarize the most important business risks in 2022. And those two words are business interrupted. The impact of the pandemic combined with cyber threats and weather events have tested business resilience and the entire supply chain. As COVID continues to cast its shadow, it is cyber risk that returns to the number one position with 44% of the respondents saying so. So what does that tell us? Cyber was sitting at number three in 2021, and in 2020, it was sitting at number one. Essentially, what this tells us is that ransomware and other forms of cyber continues to worry businesses. And while we have exceeded and accelerated into digitization and remote working, it has become a major growing concern. According to uh, our survey, cyber incidences is the most feared form of business interruption. Respondents have said that cyber risks are still not well understood like traditional risks such as fire and natural catastrophes. Therefore, mitigating against them is still not well developed. Dropping to number two, we also have business interruption. Now, this is the third time that business interruption is not at number one in the barometer. But that tells us again is that business interruption is a top of mind issue for many businesses, and it is also one of the most feared consequences. The pandemic has exposed just how fragile and complex the modern supply chain can be and how a number of events can come together and cause major problems for businesses. An example worth mentioning is the Suez Canal blockage that happened last year, as well as the global shortage of semiconductors. The rise of natural catastrophes and climate change, climate change sorry, to third and sixth respectively is also very telling. Recent years have shown that frequency and severity of weather events is also on the rise. In 2021, globally insured catastrophe losses are expected to exceed 100 billion US dollars. Hurricane Ida in the US may have been the costliest event, but what's quite interesting about that is half of the losses were actually coming from perils such as floods, uh, thunderstorms, and tornadoes. Pandemic outbreak has uh, dropped to fourth place, second uh, in 2021 basically telling us that companies are less worried about the, um, the COVID-19 and seem to be easing their way through it. And uh, also what the, uh, the, the survey was done prior to the uh, Omicron variant. So I think when the Omicron variant, that may have had an impact of, of where the pandemic outbreak uh, would have been. But what we learned from uh, the pandemic outbreak and the numbering right now is that the majority of businesses are saying, look, we're feeling relatively comfortable with managing future pandemics in the near future. Number five, you've got changes to legislation and um, regulations. Now, my colleagues have actually mentioned it right now. There's a lot happening in the front of um, legislation, regulation. You've got sanctions, trade wars. If you think about trade wars, we've had lots of trade wars with China and the US for many, many years. Uh, there's been threats thereof. There's been uh, threats of economic sanctions right now with Ukraine and 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 um, and Russia and and the European nations. Also with protectionism, we had uh, one of the presidents, uh, President Donald Trump, really put this this term into the spotlight. But it's something many countries have been practicing. Brexit. Many countries are feeling the 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 the, the impact of, of of the Brexit, and I think it was slightly overshadowed by the pandemic coming into the fold. In many years to come, we'll see more of the impact of Brexit. At number six, we have climate change. And climate change is quite interesting for us because it comes in coming from number nine to number six. It's climbing up, essentially telling us that businesses are thinking about the impact of global warming, about the re uh, reputational implications of their business and how it impacts the rest of the world. So it's climbing up from number nine to number six. And then at number seven, we've got fine explosion. It remains flat. Uh, fine explosion is a risk that many entities will always have and we anticipate it to be in the risk barometer for many more years to come. Number eight, market developments. Previously sitting at number four has come down uh, to, to number eight. So essentially what we're learning from the survey is that many businesses are feeling a little bit more stable. They're feeling stability. They're feeling less volatile. They're not seeing too many entrants into the market. And obviously that has may have a lot to do with the pandemic. Uh, we, we're seeing some mergers and acquisitions. Uh, however, they're not as intense uh, as we previously had them in the past. And market stagnation and market uh, fluctuations have sort of are sort of normalizing. 
Number nine, is, which is a new risk that's coming to the Alliance Risk Barometer, is the shortage of skilled workforce. Now, this is an interesting risk that's come in previously. It was sitting at number 13, never in the top 10. What the global community is telling us is they're having issues uh, the, with the attracting of new staff, with the retention thereof, and also the pandemic coming in, they're seeing a lot of um, absenteeism coming to the business as people take time to recover from COVID. Number nine, we've got the macroeconomic developments, and uh, that's gone down from number eight. Uh, it's uh, it's sitting at number 10 this year, and it is um, essentially the, the government spending, that's monetary policies, austerity programs, lots of focus really over the last uh, 18 months has been primarily on COVID. So uh, our businesses are feeling that governments are not spending as much as they could or should have done in the past, so they're feeling a bit more comfortable with how money is being spent. Next slide, please. So I thought I should share the top 10 business risks in Africa and the Middle East, uh, because there are some slight deviations from the global community. So the first two risks, which is cyber incidences um, and uh, business interruption, very much identical with uh, what is happening within the global community. However, what's interesting to uh, note here is that the pandemic outbreak is number three within Africa and the Middle East. So essentially for us, businesses are still looking at the pandemic as an issue. However, it's come down because last year it was the number one risk in the barometer. So yes, there's a level of comfort in terms of saying, look, we sort of understand a little bit more about the virus. Number two, we've managed to develop mechanisms to work around our workforce issues. Our staff, our, our employees can sort of work. We know what to do. And also from a government perspective, you can sort of see that there's been some relaxation in terms of the restrictions that were previously imposed at level five. So yes, it's coming down a little bit, but um, it, it's still there at number three. And also, if you look at uh, Africa and the Middle East, uh, number four, the political risk and violence. I did anticipate to see this risk because as a continent and the Middle East, uh, we do have a lot of political instability. We do have wars and terrorism. Uh, I mean, in South Africa specifically, we had recently some civil commotion, some riots and looting, and it is reflected in the Alliance Risk Barometer. If you look at it last year, it was sitting at number six, it's coming up to number four. And uh, again, uh, I mean, political risk and violence, I anticipate this risk will be climbing up the ranks. We'll just have to see where it lands in 2023. Um, for number five, changes in legislation and regulation. Interestingly enough, the global community as well as Africa and the Middle East very much identical in this front, sitting at number five. It has actually come up from previously sitting at number eight. Uh, companies in Africa and the Middle East are saying, look, we were concerned about trade wars and, 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 and all economic sanctions. And as we've mentioned, Ukraine and Russia, it'll be interesting how it impacts the continent as well as the Middle East. Uh, number six. Is a very interesting risk that is very pertinent to the to the continent uh, and somewhat the Middle East, I could say, in terms of critical infrastructure blackouts, and that speaks to power disruptions. And as a South African, it's something that has been a very sore, thorny topic in our lives. Uh, we, we've been experiencing a lot of power disruptions and failures, and hence why it's reflected in the in the barometer. It was at number 10 last year, it's coming up to number six. I anticipate, unfortunately for us South Africans, that we may one day see it slightly higher up, maybe in the top three. Uh, we are seeing a lot of power disruptions interrupting businesses and how they work and uh, they are also elements and issues of infrastructure um aging infrastructure you know we could get dams and bridges and uh, we've got a lot of climate uh, flooding happening and we're seeing a lot of damage to our infrastructure so so we're seeing critical infrastructure and blackouts being problematic for businesses in in the barometer Number seven, macroeconomic developments uh, is coming down, was sitting at number four last year, and that essentially speaks to government spend, as I previously mentioned, uh, and there's also another number seven, which is market developments coming up. Um, essentially, what that means for uh, African businesses, as well as the Middle East, is that they're sensing a, a bit of volatility in the markets. There are some new entrants, new companies walking in, taking advantage of the pandemic. We're seeing some mergers and acquisitions. There is a little bit of stagnation for certain countries, and uh, I mean, South Africa being one of them, and there are some um, a mar a market uh, fluctuations as well. Uh, number nine and number 10 are quite interesting uh, risks that have come into the, the top 10. They are loss of reputation and brand value. Um, with the society that we live in being very much uh, interconnected and uh, with the likes of social media being so accessible to many people, we're seeing this risk come up at number, ten, at number nine, my apologies, uh, as businesses are acknowledging that uh, the loss of their reputation and brand is something important. Um, with the likes of social media coming up in the front, it is easy for a brand to lose its value um, so it is important for business to control or at least be able to access their markets through many different forms of social media. So very, very interesting risk uh, that businesses are, are pointing out to, to in the barometer. 
And then number 10, we've got climate change. Uh, climate change is a very topical issue, especially for the continent and the Middle East in terms of just looking at global warming. Uh, for us as, as, as South Africa as well, we've got entities like ESCOM who are predominantly coal producers, uh, coal users, sorry. And we've got mines as well who produce uh, coal. And, and, and therefore we, we're looking at, we're seeing a lot of conversation in government uh, around the political landscape and the private sector around how do we manage um, climate change? How do we contribute towards our, our carbon emissions? And there's a lot of friction and there's a lot of movement towards the renewable energy space. And uh, as Allianz, we've really tried to position ourselves to, to move towards renewable renewable energy and support businesses that gravitate towards that side. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. Ah, so some selected uh, result highlights um, at a global level. So we have the three risks. We've got cyber, business interruption, and natural catastrophes. These are our top three risks. The pandemic outbreak globally has dropped. It historically, it used to be at number two, now it's at number four. Businesses are feeling a lot more comfortable. They feel better prepared to deal with uh, pandemic outbreaks in the near future, which is a great thing. And as my colleagues have previously mentioned, businesses are looking to recovery, a recovery right now. Uh, however, natural catastrophes and climate change is proving to be a sore point. It is really a problem as we are experiencing a lot of extreme weather. We are seeing a lot of flooding. We are seeing a lot of wind. We are seeing a lot of tornadoes. So it is something that we're going to have to manage and learn to live with as businesses. And also the shortage of uh, skilled workers, which came into the global uh, barometer, uh, that is something that we uh, uh, businesses have to find a way to mitigate against, really trying to attract the right workers, especially now that people are able to work remotely. You you may have, um, businesses now may have access to, to talents in different countries. So maybe next year we may not see this risk there, but if it is, that means business is still struggling to find a solution. Uh, essentially, um, overall, the past 18 months have really been a wake up call to businesses. And what they say to us is, there's too many elements, too many factors that can come in and interrupt their business. And at this point in time, they're seeing that these risks will likely uh, remain highly uh, uh, elevated. And it's something that they need to be at top of mind uh, for all businesses. Uh, that is all from my side. I'd like to hand over as well to my colleague, Arthur Yao, who will go into greater detail in terms of business interruption, cyber and natural catastrophe. Thank you. Really? I'm, I'm looking at the clock. And I think we we eight minutes away from the from the close. Uh, I mean, in the in the interest of time, I will, I will just actually spend a few words on on these uh, trio uh, top risk for for Africa, which is basically cyber business interruption and and um, and then pandemic uh, outbreak. If I look at the outcome for from uh, last year, I mean, it's exactly the same trio but in a reverse order. So uh, cyber, which was actually the number three uh, last year, actually made it way to, to the top uh, uh, in this uh, year's survey uh, as number one. In fact, I mean, these three uh, risks are actually combining to fuel the, the major or the key concern on the part of the businesses, which is mainly their ability to produce and, and deliver the, the, their services. And as we're gradually going out of uh, this uh, pandemic uh, situation, one can recognize that, you know, in the past year, basically, I mean, the, the, the capacity for the companies to actually uh, produce their, their, their goods and actually deliver them, I mean, in the, in the, in the desired way, basically, has been a really challenge. And that has been on the, on the back of, let's say, the increase in cyber attacks, but also the, the disruption in, 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 uh, in supply chain and uh, all the pandemic uh, related uh, issues uh, that have really, you know, impacted, uh, let's say, the, the, the supply chain um, overall. So, I mean, to quote the, the, the CEO of, uh, of uh, uh, AGCNS, I mean, the, the key and the main risk basically uh, for 2022 is, 2022 is going to be basically the, the the fear of having you know business uh, interrupted, and uh, we will recognize that you know towards uh, I mean such a, a risk there will be a call for a, a major focus on building resilience. Looking into cyber uh, specifically, uh, cyber as I said, uh, uh, next slide please. Yeah, cyber has come as a number number one. I mean for the global uh, response. Uh, similarly, also to uh, the outcome for for Africa, one key observation we need to actually have here is basically to see that uh, 
I mean, the, 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 the cyber risk is actually changing in nature because we see, I mean, uh, 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 cyber criminal, uh, criminals are basically uh, being more imaginative and actually coming up with, uh, with uh, more tactics exploiting you know the new vulnerabilities that are actually coming up also in the face of the increase uh, let's say uh, changing work related behavior like working remotely let's look at uh, the the next slide and then the, this slide here actually gives us a, a, an overview of the major uh, exposures uh, when it comes to uh, cyber the cyber risk and on top of the, the exposures, basically, one can actually mention the uh, ransomware attacks, followed that by the, the data the data breaches. And like I just actually mentioned now, with uh, let's say a many supply chain business also being actually now provided digitally, you know, we we have some threats also coming. So the next slide. Okay, I'm not seeing it. Okay, business interruption. So business interruption remains number two, uh, just as uh, last year. And um, the main thing to say uh, about uh, business interruption is that um, it is basically, I mean, the one risk that, you know, cyber and uh, let's say, um, uh, pandemics basically are feeding into because they are also combined to actually make a business interruption a more, uh, let's say, visible uh, threat to 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 businesses. Uh, next one, pandemic outbreak. So here, I mean, I think the main observation we need to keep in mind has been mentioned before is that uh, pandemic outbreak has actually gone down. I mean, the ranking uh, to to number three. But that is actually uh, owing to the fact that, uh, you know, we've actually, uh, I mean, most businesses have actually tested the, the, the uh, business continuity uh, management systems and, and, and everything, and they feel actually more and more prepared to face the, the, the future incidents, actually. One more thing to say, and, and I will stop there, uh, is actually about, uh, let's say, uh, natural catastrophes, actually. I mean, it's all one of the, the other risks that actually came up uh, through the survey, and that is also a major uh, a major contributor to the the fear of uh, business interruptions, basically. And uh, for for natural catastrophe, uh, one can actually recognize that on the past year, uh, over the past year, basically, it is estimated that the the total amount of insured claims, basically, uh, insured losses, actually. Uh, coming from um, natural capacity and natural catastrophe is actually, I mean, is over $100 billion actually. And this is covering things like, uh, let's say, um, weather related uh, severe events actually. Uh, so rainfalls, uh, uh, flash floods, and, and so on and so forth actually. The, 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 um, a representation or an overview of the, the detailed outcome of the survey for each and every, I mean, a selection of countries, actually. And for the sake of time and to allow for, for some uh, Q&A, basically, I think we're going to, to leave that uh, as it is. Thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of slides uh, that we're sharing on the screen right now. These are some of the top uh, 10 risks from South Africa. Um, so from a South African audience, just to see the top three, can we just go back there? The first one being cyber, second business disruption, and third critical infrastructure blackouts. Really, as I mentioned earlier, South Africa has been going through a lot of power disrupted, uh, disruptions and failures. So uh, it is reflected in the top three. Uh, can we just quickly go through another country, please? Uh, Nigeria, cyber again, political risk and violence and macroeconomic development, uh, political instability coming in at number two, uh, civil commotion, riots and looting. That's quite an interesting top three from Nigeria. And then let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, Kenya, business interruption at number one, political risk and pandemic outbreak. These are the Kenyan ones. Um, again, political risk coming into the fold for both Nigeria and Kenya and business interruption sitting at number one. Thank you. Ghana. 
business interruption again at number one. Uh, cyber coming in at number two, that's interesting for Ghana. And climate change at number three, uh, very interesting that uh, it is coming in. And then number four, Namibia is quite a new country, first time doing the risk barometer, business interruption number one, changes in legislation and pandemic at number three. Thank you.